Hello again and welcome to another Mordian Glory Warhammer 40k video. In today's episode, I want to take you through step by step my 2000 point competitive mechanized guard army. This is the list that I took to Adepticon 2024 and it actually performed really well. There will be a separate after action report coming out. But this list actually was able to go three on one, taking on a variety of opponents from fast assault armies to long range vehicle heavy forces as well. Personally, I found this list really fun to use as well as it being highly effective on the tabletop. And so I'm going to take you through it and I'll share with you some of the thoughts behind the unit choices and the war gear, as well as some of the real life logistics that I had to take into account when transporting a list from the UK to the US. So without further ado, let's not mess around any further. Let's mount up, roll out and drive right into today's episode. So let's begin with a quick rundown of the entire army list. Starting off on the left, we have a tank commander, a venerable boxy Lehman Russ with the El Clasico loadout. We've got a battle cannon, a las cannon, two heavy bolters, a hunter killer missile and a storm bolter. Some of you may be wondering, what is the thoughts behind the storm bolter over the heavy stubber? That's just what he's modelled with. And I was trying to be as WYSIWYG as possible with this list because I'm going all the way to Adepticon. They can be quite strict with WYSIWYG at that event. And so I wouldn't want there to be any potential snafus. This tank commander has been enhanced with the Grand Strategist, which means he can do two tank orders. He is quite the linchpin in the army, considering that he is bringing two thirds of my orders to the tabletop because I've got him and one of the tank commander. He is very, very important to this list. Amazingly, most of my opponents didn't bother going after him. And this is because he tended to sit back and do his long range fire support and just order the artillery around. And uh, also there was a lot of other units that were pushing forward, putting the enemy under pressure and kind of occupying their attention. Speaking of which, other units in the army that is, we have got some more fire support. We've got a Lehman Ross Exterminator. Fantastic Force Multiplier, it's Withering Hail ability really boosts the damage of the other weapons, just cutting through the enemy armor with the extra AP. And uh, I supplemented the Exterminator Autocannon with two multi melters and a Heavy Bolter. I've also got a Heavy Stubber and a Hunter Killer Missile on there. Attention Guardsmen, the Commissar has detected you have not yet liked this video. Do so immediately or else you will face the Empress Wrath. And anyone who has not yet subscribed to the channel will be transferred to the penal battalions. That is all. Move out! I like to go for this particular loadout because I find that the exterminator is getting somewhat up close and personal anyway. It does have a 48 inch range, but for it to be truly effective, you typically want to get it within 24 inch range. And then the enemy starts moving towards you, so you find yourself within an 18 inch range very easily. So. Despite the fact that it looks like it's got a long range gun on top and then loads of short range guns around it, you tend to find that you are well within multi melter range and rapid fire heavy stubber range pretty much from the get go. After the exterminator, we have the trusty, venerable basilisk. I love this thing. It is my favorite artillery piece in 10th edition right now. Solid stat line with and solid damage dealing capabilities, as well as being able to slow the enemy down. I cannot tell you the number of games where I have almost won it purely on the fact that the Basilisk has Earthshaker shells, which reduces the enemy movement by two, the enemy charge by two, and the enemy advance by two as well. In one turn, you can potentially take six inches of movement off your opponent. And when I use this thing against World Eaters at Adepticon, it went from an eight bound unit having a guaranteed charge to an eight bound unit completely flubbing and failing their charge, which then allowed us to pick them up and destroy them. So the Basilisk is good fast spot, but a bit like the Exterminator, it's a surprisingly good force multiplier because it messes up your enemy's plans. But this is not the only big guns we're bringing to the table because we've got some more over here. We've got another tank commander with a demarcher cannon, a heavy bolter, and we've got two plasma cannons on there as well. Of course, we've got a heavy stubber and a hunter killer missile too. This demarcher tank commander is really there to 
provide some frontline order support. I am going to have a number of units such as the previously mentioned exterminator that will be getting quite close to the enemy. And so having some orders that can move forward and still be safe inside a metal box is great. Also the Marsh Cannon just slaps. This guy in one round of shooting took out a Plague Burst Crawler at the event. So they do have good damage. The reason I don't spam the Marsh Cannons everywhere is they are quite swingy. I've had this guy fire and literally do one or two damage. And then I've had him do 15 in one go. I like to sprinkle one to two Demarche Cannons in a lot of my guard lists, but they're not my go-to weapon, just because personally I've found the results to vary wildly. Next to the Demarche Tank Commander is possibly my new favorite Lehman Russ loadout. It's a Lehman Russ battle tank, just bog standard one with its battle cannon, plasma cannons, las cannon, heavy stubber and hunter killer missile. What I love about this thing so much is it gets full rerolls. Unlike a lot of the Lehman Russes whose abilities only affect their turrets, the battle tank gets full rerolls on all of its weapons as long as the enemy is on an objective. And considering 10th edition is about standing on circles, I have found pretty much every single turn this guy is getting his full rerolls. He's also got the range, which means he can stay still and draw line of sight to the objective he's basically covering and overwatching. And so he's getting lethal hits as well. Speaking of Overwatch, he does still get his full rerolls on Overwatch as well, which makes him a surprisingly good unit for just covering a firing lane and locking down a middle ground objective. We've then got a little bit more indirect fire. This is the Manticore. You know them, you love them. They are very hot in Imperial Guard lists right now. The ability to sling out indirect fire, flat damage three shots is amazing. They are very swingy though. They're D6 plus one shots. The reason why I'm not taking double Manticore is because I like a little bit of reliability. I want to have my Basilisk, which I can just know it's going to be putting out a decent number of shots because it's D6 plus three every single turn. And then I've got a bit of a wild card here with the Manticore. Sometimes it flubs it and just gets two shots. Sometimes it gets a lot more than that. And if you start shooting it at enemy infantry or enemy units that have got five or more models, it starts getting full rerolls, which can make it somewhat self-sufficient and not as reliant upon orders. Now that covers all of the fire support and the big guns, but now we need to get to the meat and potatoes of this list the mechanized infantry. And I have got six armored fist squads, six units of infantry inside six chimeras. Now all of the infantry are identical. They have got two flamers and they are Kathchan jungle fighters. Each one of these infantry squads goes inside a chimera and because the Kathchans have scout, they confer that scout to their dedicated transport. So actually you'll find that these chimeras are really, really fast. They're scout mirrors. They're moving four, six inches and then with their scout move and then they're moving their 10 inch move. I really, really like the scout chimeras. I cannot big them up enough. They were the key to victory. They were the unit that the entire list was built around. They were getting early game secondaries. If I drew extended battle lines, boom, I can get it. If I draw secure nomads on, boom, I could get it. If I wanted to push onto primary and know that I was going to be able to take and hold it, this is what these guys could do. Because what I tended to find is the enemy could destroy the Chimera, but then the 10 infantry would just pile out onto the objective, off and out of line of sight. And it's like, oh, so that's still my objective. And often my opponent would kind of expose themselves and push forward a little bit and extend themselves to get that Chimera kill for it to not actually take any points away from me and then the big guns could start hammering them back. Now in this list, I've got a mixture of Chimera loadouts. I've got uh, four of them, these three here and this one over here with double heavy bolter, heavy stubber and uh, we've got the Laz gun arrays, hunter killer missiles, all that kind of stuff. This is definitely my go-to loadout for Chimeras. It's very effective and allows you to just put out a ridiculous amount of firepower and the damage well i would say not a ridiculous amount of firepower a ridiculous amount of shots which provides a significant level 
of chip damage. However, I did have two more Chimeras, and these were with Multilaser and also with Storm Bolters. Again, this is what they were modelled with, but there were some other extenuating circumstances why I went for this particular loadout and these particular models, which we'll cover when we go over some of the broader tactics and logistics associated with this list. Last but certainly not least, we've got a few cheeky chappies. Two Scout Sentinels, both equipped with LAS Cannons, Hunter Killer Missiles, and Sentinel Chainsaws, and we've also got a Cyclops Demolition Vehicle. Cyclops, you know it, you love it, it goes into reserve, it pops on the board turn two, turn three, and starts getting things like behind enemy lines, or investigate signals, or deploy teleport homes, anything like that. And even if it has to come on, you've not drawn those cards, you tend to have to tuck it away in a corner somewhere, you forget about it, your opponent forgets about it, and then you draw that card, you know, round four, round five, and you can still get those sweet, sweet victory points. I never leave home without at least one of these cheeky buggers. And then the two Scout Sentinels. I have been neglecting my Scout Sentinel game for a long time. Uh, they were either on the wrong base size, or I, in the case of these green ones, they needed repainting as part of the Great Morgan Restoration Project. And so it's taken me a while to finally get Sentinels into my list. And let me say, they did not disappoint. I am really, really impressed with these guys. They're fast with their scout move 9 and their regular move of 10. Uh, they're wickedly durable. Uh, coming at toughness 7 and a 3-up save. And the, their daring recon completely supercharges your artillery as well as providing sweet rerolls to some of those other units in your army uh, which, which could very much benefit from them. I'm looking to get a lot more Sentinels in my army. These ones I used in essentially two ways. Nip forward and get some early game um, engagement or fronts if I drew that card. Uh, or Daring Recon. Lots of Daring Recon, lots of fire support. And their last kinds of Hunter Killer Missiles uh, did take off a fair number of wounds over the course of the uh, games that I played with them. So overall, I like Scout Sentinels. They're very flexible and uh, they provide a lot of extra juice to the army. So that just about covers the list in full. But now let's go over some of the general strategies and tactics that I use. The big thing around this list was the scout mirrors. It provided me with a lot of maneuverability. That scout move plus the regular move meant that for the first time in a long time, my guard army did not feel slow and cumbersome and grindy. It actually felt fast, agile and maneuverable. Not only does this, like I said, get me secondaries and get me primary points, but it also allows me to actually put my opponent under pressure. If you're familiar with how Gar plays, what you tend to find is you sort of march up to the middle of the board and then you have to hold the line and desperately try and hold on to the objectives. Or you find that the enemy is a high pressure list like Orcs or World Eaters and they come sprinting at you and you've got to hold and try and clear them as quickly as possible to hopefully claw back some points in the later games, later turns. That was not what happened with this list. This list was the aggressor. This list was pushing forward. In one of my games, I actually took the fight to the Orcs and essentially overran them with a bit of an armoured Blitzkrieg. Speaking of armoured Blitzkrieg, of just armoured targets, there's a huge amount of tank saturation here. So many metal boxes. We are in a meta... Of vehicles and monsters that is what 10th edition is all about and there's a lot of vehicles here and these vehicles are surprisingly durable a lot of people underestimate how tough it is to take down a chimera but it's got toughness nine which means you need proper anti-tank to deal with it you can try and fish for fours with things like melters and auto cannons but sometimes those fours just don't come up really you need a large cannon if you want to or the equivalent to really bring these things down and even if you do, they've got a 3-up save, which means if you hit them something that's AP minus 3 and they're in cover, or they pop smoke, they're going to be on a 5-up save. That crops up more often than you think. And even if you do get the wound through, they're 11 wounds. So that's an extra damage to shot you've got to put into them. That's an extra little bit of firepower you've got to put into them in order to crack them open and bring them down. In the majority of my games, I did lose my Chimeras, but I often wouldn't lose all of them, and I rarely lost a battle tank because my opponent was so preoccupied with destroying the 
quote unquote light vehicles in this list. But I genuinely found them to be surprisingly durable. That is the phrase I would use with them. And as we mentioned, their firepower isn't negligible. You can't just ignore it. When you've got three chimeras on a flank, all shooting you down with heavy bolters, heavy stubbers, you've got two flamers out the firing deck, you've got a whole bunch of las gun shots, and then you've got 300 killer missiles, that can actually do damage. In fact, in one game I had versus Death Guard, three chimeras combined their firepower and were able to bring down a baby knight, a Chaos Knight Brigand. Now that's not you know, a huge, amazing achievement, but it's actually very good when you think that this was done with, by what well, many would consider my spare firepower. Just using my incidental firepower, I brought down a knight. That was a big deal. In essence, what this list likes to do is strike hard, strike fast, move forward, take objectives, lock them down, and keep the enemy so busy with the number of armored targets that are in their face, which are the chimeras, that they don't realize before it's too late that the real threat is the big boom boom behind. Taking a pounding from four Lehman Russes and two artillery pieces, turn after turn after turn, is brutal. I had several games where my opponent would come in, they detrack a whole bunch of chimeras, and then they would die. Because firepower is not something that is in short supply with this list. However, there is one big weakness with this army, and that is close combat. If you look, I have zero combat capabilities. I have no Bulgrins or anything like that. There's no Strachan in here. It's a lot of firepower and a lot of tanks. If my opponent has good close range, close combat anti-tank, that is a bit of a weakness for this army. However, close combat is not entirely off the table. A, I've got tank shock, which shouldn't be underestimated. But B, there are a lot of combat units out there which don't want to get charged by a metal box. They're not designed for killing vehicles, they're more for shredding infantry. A good example of this is Necron Wraiths. Necron Wraiths are a bit of a boogeyman unit right now. They are very tough, they're surprisingly fast, and with a lot of the Necron shenanigans, they can be wherever they need to be. But the one thing they don't want to be doing is trying to kill vehicles because they're like strength five or strength six. Like they're wounding you on fives at best. And a really effective strategy I found for just negating them, frustrating them, and just causing my opponent a big headache was to take Chimera and just charge it. Charge it straight into those wraiths. And every single time that I have done that, those wraiths fail to kill the Chimera. And in return, those Necron Wraiths were forced to fall back, essentially taking them out for a turn. And remember, every single turn that your opponent is wasting one of his units, that unit has just lost 20% of its battlefield potential because there's only five turns in a game. Now that covers all of the strategies and tactics, but now let's get into everyone's favorite topic, logistics. I know, only the most exciting of talking points in the Morning Glory channel. This army needed to be able to travel and I couldn't put it in the hold in my suitcase because it would have got squashed. So I had to be able to fit this into my hand luggage. As a result, you'll notice that some of the larger units such as Rogal Dawns and Super Heavies, which would have been quite effective on the terrain at Adepticon, are not present. Also, you'll notice that instead of taking like masses upon masses of infantry, which can sometimes take up a lot of space, uh, the reason I've gone for all of these chimeras and stuff is this entire army fit in my hand luggage. Essentially two small army cases, one on my backpack and one in essentially a laptop bag. So this army was very compact, very easy to transport, but I was limited with the kind of foam, the kind of foam that I had available to transport the units. So that's why you don't see things like Rogal Dawns. But the funny thing is that those sort of travel restrictions, those space restrictions that I had in the army, actually caused me to try out a couple of different things. When I've been running Met Guard in the UK, I've always shoved a Rogal Dawn, if not two, into the army. And I've been Team Rogal Dawn for a while, and I've kind of moved away from relying upon the Lehman Russ. This army forced me to start relying upon the trusty Lehman Russ once again. And let me tell you, it didn't let me down. 
There's a lot of chit and chat about how good the Rogal Dawn is. Hey, I talk about how good the Rogal Dawn is. But if you're someone that's just not a fan of that vehicle and you like the more traditional guard things, then don't you worry. The Lima Russ will still see you through. And every single one of these loadouts, every single one of these varieties did me proud in Adepticon. One last thing to mention, some eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that this list is two very distinct color schemes. Now, I didn't do that to power game in any way, shape, or form. Take the best bits from the Mordians and the best bits from the Steel Legion. I actually have more than enough Steel Legion to make a very, very effective Steel Legionist. And likewise, I have more than enough tanks and vehicles to make a very effective Mordian mechanized list. The reason that I went with this style of army with these two distinct color schemes is firstly Adepticon has a lot of soft score for things like fluff and theming around your army and so the theme for my army was it was a joint task force with exactly 1000 points spent on Mordians and 1000 points spent on Steel Legion. Another reason though and to be honest the number one reason was the team tournament. You see I wasn't just there to go to Adepticon for the singles I was also taking part in the big team tournament, which essentially consists of five doubles games. You have teams of four, and each round, two on each team pair up, and the two pair up, and essentially play a series of doubles games. It's really, really fun, and I will be doing an after action report and a video going through the lists for that uh, team tournament, both the ones that were on my, you know, that I ran and the ones that were on the team, but essentially, one of my teammates needed a thousand points of Imperium because the rest of us had Imperium and he was bringing Tau. And I'll be damned if I have Tau on my team. <laughs> so I built this list. So not only was it a cohesive 2000 point army, but it could split down perfectly into two separate 1000 point forces as well. But that just about wraps it up. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think about this list down in the comment section below. Do you like it or is there anything that you would change about it? Also, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is a lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty to a heartfelt thank you to alex dengal bon bon vert mad larkin marcus roberts mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Wolf, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.